Um, hello, friends. Welcome to the 2016, uh, 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, since 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. Um, for us, the qualification um, to be a leader was uh, taking a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And um, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and at any point in their lives or profession. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, no single community or person has a monopoly on leadership. All you need to be, uh, is to be able to wish to make change. And um, if not for our work, most of this information would have stayed immobilized or landfill and lengthy PDFs or uh, would have been limited to expensive international conferences. So we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating. But um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of challenges we face, which are all planetary. We have our battles to fight and uh, we'll have many heroes, successes and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, take your time. And uh, when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you to take the next step. And I'll be here to help you in any other way possible. In addition to the, uh, the Global Dialogue on Waste, every year we also publish uh, uh, Waste Pioneers List. And once the Pioneers List is uh, published, uh, uh, we also do interviews with the 30 organizations or individuals who are doing amazing work, um, sharing their stories, sharing their solutions on social media. In addition to that, we also have a community newsletter. What that means is if you're a contributor of your, uh, or you, if you're a panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could use our newsletter as a platform for you. So if you have any work updates, if you have any achievements that you'd like to share, if you have any articles that you've written, send it to us and then we'll share it with our community using the community newsletter. And um, this year, um, uh, for, for the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, we have uh, about 330 registrations which is, uh, you know, we're really happy. It's an overwhelming response. Thank you very much for your support. Um, and uh, in, and uh, one last update. Uh, this comes from our LinkedIn um, group, LinkedIn community. Um, Heather Troutman, researcher at the Hafen City University, Hamburg, has posted that she was selected to chair a technical session at the sixth International Marine Debris Conference, which will take place in San Diego, California from 12th to 16th of March, 2018. Uh, they're looking for um, a successful case studies. And uh, this conference is being organized by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration and the UN Environment. So if you want more details, you can go to the LinkedIn group and you'll be able to find more details there. So um, coming to today's um, uh, session, uh, we'll be talking about um, what practitioners worldwide who are at the front lines and practice and waste management, what kind of challenges they're facing, how they're dealing with them, and uh, and we'll just find find more about their experiences working in this space in different parts of the world. Um, um, first, we have uh, Mani Vajpayee. Um, uh, he's the CEO and founder of uh, Banyan Nation, which is a, uh, well, I'll, I'll let him uh, tell you more about, you know, what he's doing and, um, about his company, Money. Welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. How are you? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Um, to talk briefly about our work at Bandit Nation, uh, Ranjit, I can hear you uh, feedback back to me. So if you can. Thanks. Um, basically, the work we do at Bandit Nation comprises of um, uh, solving some solutions in the plastic uh, uh, waste management space in India. And uh, our work spans across the entire value chain, starting from collection, transportation, uh, all the way in the back end to plastic recycling. So um, uh, our team at Bani Nation, I think what we've learned in the last few years is there's no silver bullet. I mean, there's no magic solution to solving the waste crisis in India, uh, particularly in the plastic value chain that we are focusing on. Uh, innovations across the value chain, right from integration of the informal sector in the front end to uh, polymer engineering uh, innovations in the back end to ensure high quality plastic uh, is manufactured, recycled plastic is manufactured so that you compel brands uh, to use more and more recycled content instead of virgin content as is, is probably the need of the hour. 
So um, that's what we do at Banyan Nation, and we've been doing it Banyan Nation for the past three and a half, four years since we've uh, begun our work in India. Right. And um, today, so um, our plan is to discuss uh, how. Um, well, uh, well, let me just put a context around this um, topic. So. Um, the informal sector in um, developing countries, it's um, a significant uh, part it's, uh, of the waste management um, supply chain. And um, the informal sector are entrepreneurs, you know, they're independent and, uh, and they're looking for opportunities to, um, uh, for, uh, for earning a better livelihood. But again, yeah. they're also one of the uh, poorest in, um, you know, cities. So, um, uh, that's something that needs to be considered, uh, you know, when when we're working with them. Uh, and um, there has been a lot of work um, in Latin America, in Africa, and in India, uh, working with informal uh, recycling, uh, informal recycling sector. But most yeah. of that has uh, come from uh, non-profit organizations, uh, uh, and most of the knowledge that's available out there is from non-profit organizations uh, engaging with informal sector. And we haven't really had a chance to understand how entrepreneurs are doing it, and which is why um, we, we thought it'd be a great idea to have money here uh, to talk about what his experiences are in engaging with them. And uh, this topic was suggested to us by Narsinga Panigrahi from um, Orissa, Bhubaneswar. He's organizing a viewing session again today um, with his friends and colleagues um, who are watching this together. And we're extremely happy that uh, we could, uh, 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste could act as an occasion to bring like-minded people together in a in a local community, um, so um, Mani, could you could you talk to us a little bit about you know your experiences? You know, first off, what what would you like to tell people you know about informal sector, and you know, and then you know maybe we could talk about your experiences working with them. Sure. Sure. Um, when Banyan started off back in uh, 2013, um, there was lack of data really on the waste flows. And um, uh, Ranjit, you have been aware of our journey uh, since uh, 2013. I mean, back uh, from the time I called you from Apple campus uh, in 2011. Uh, uh, coming back to the informal sector, I think uh, you make a very relevant point in the sense that it's uh, very important to treat the informal sector for what they are. They are probably the most vital cog in the waste supply chain, particularly the recycling value chain in a country like India. Now, you, you, you cannot build meaningful, scalable systems um, in emerging markets without the inclusion and involvement of informal sector. I think these are the fundamental truths, right? Now, uh, I have to give you a context uh, in the Indian context for our global viewers, um, if, if they are. Um, it, 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 you take the example of a city like Hyderabad. I think these numbers basically give you a context uh, for us to then scale the um, uh, uh, whole, whole, uh, whole value chain. So in a city like Hyderabad, um, there's about uh, 5,000 tons of municipal solid waste generated a day. And the work we do um, is just plastics. And out of the 500 tons of post-consumer waste, close to 350, 400 tons is post-consumer plastic waste. Now, there's roughly around 20 to 25,000 rag pickers or itinerant collectors in the city of Hyderabad. And uh, uh, the rag pickers and the itinerant, uh, itinerant collectors do a fantastic job, which is something that I keep saying that contrary to what we all think, India has one of the highest uh, plastic recovery rates. And that is primarily due to the informal sector that you brought up. So without the informal sector, uh, India also would be like some of the developed countries where just collection and segregation of waste itself is a major challenge. I mean, compare India's uh, recovery systems at 70% to a West's recovery uh, system, which is around 20%. While I'm not justifying that, that is exactly the right way to do it. I'm just uh, putting, merely stating a fact that 70% of plastics are being collected by the informal sector. And the first line of defense here or the first line of pickup is the itinerant guys and the servant maids and everybody who's scavenging right from your household bin to the street corner bins. They feed into the stationary recyclers. And to give you a context on the numbers here, there's about 2,500 to 3,000 stationary collectors sitting uniformly across the city of Hyderabad, spread uniformly. I mean, we call them the Kapadiwalas, but um, you know, these stationary guys we call form the neck of the funnel. Now, what we did in 2013 when we got to India was we believed that 
these street corner stationary collectors who have a small kiosk who do about half a ton 400 to 500 kilos um, of all materials a single day would be the ideal partner or an ideal supply chain partner for a company like Banyan Nation and as I said we collect material from the informal sector particularly the stationary recyclers who are one of our suppliers I mean they're not our exclusive suppliers because Banyan works with uh, directly with industries um, uh, works directly with uh, informal sector recyclers and other startups and other waste management companies who are willing to use plastic so for us uh, everybody is a supply chain uh, as part of our supply chain and then we recycle the plastic into what we call as better plastic that we give to brands to mainstream the use of recycled plastic now once again coming to the focus of the informal sector there are two ways to look at it right the front end and the back end what i mean by the front end is purely the collection systems themselves and out of the 400 to 500 tons of materials uh, that are recovered or 350 uh, tons of plastics materials that are recovered per single day the informal sector basically does a phenomenal job in picking them up but the challenge lies in the back end recycling itself where the recycling activities are also driven by the informal sector so when we talk about informal sector we typically talk about the rag pickers and then leave them then you have the kabadiwalas then you have the traders then you have the recyclers who have the extrusion lines and grinding lines every single piece in the value chain is informal in nature and therein lies the problem because the quality of the material, the compliance in the value chain, ethical business practices in the value chain, and all these become a huge challenge in India. And to close out on the numbers, Hyderabad has about 20,000, 30,000 ignorant informal sector recyclers, 2,500 stationary recyclers, about 100 and 150 massive uh, uh, three ton, four ton per day aggregators, and about 500 informal recyclers who take the plastics grind them up wash them and convert them into pellets each of them i believe i believe are informal sector because uh, of the way they run their business and uh, banyan's work in 2013 has been with the front end which is the stationary recyclers where we developed a technology platform to integrate over 2000 of these informal sector recyclers into our supply chain and i'll pause here for a second and then uh, take your call, uh, feedback and then probably move, move forward. Right. So, and um, all the numbers that you mentioned are um, for a uh, city, which is about um, 10 million people. That's uh, right. The city of eight to 10 million people. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Eight to 10 million people. And it's the sixth or sixth or seventh largest city in India. So um, that's right. Your cities probably have, uh, you know, bigger numbers uh, and, uh, and the way it works uh, with informal recycling is, the bigger the city gets, it kind of increases exponentially. I don't have any empirical evidence for it, but that's kind of something that we observe. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, I think coming back to one of the important points here, I think how do you work now, now taking into account the fact that we've already started working with the stationary recyclers in a city like Hyderabad, how do you engage with them? I think to quickly uh, summarize some bullet items, I think there's a lot of skepticism when we started out in 2013, when we started working with them, everybody is like, oh my God, this is mafia. Um, and uh, they're loan shark and it's very difficult to work with them. Contrary to all these assumptions, when you start working with them, uh, you put a very good point. I mean, if you treat them without uh, a pa patronizing tone and you treat them as entrepreneurs and you treat them as people who are giving you business and you give them business back and treat them with dignity, you'll do very well in penetrating the informal sector. So what happened is in 2013, 2014, when we started this whole uh, informal sector integration platform, uh, the only thing that we offered the informal sector was a steady business, a good market rate, and dignity and uh, uh, respect when it comes to dealing in business. In fact, the first two things are what they care most. I mean, you have to have give them a steady business of X tons per month, and you also have to pay them fair market rates with on-the-spot payments. And the informal sector immediately, I apologize for that, the informal sector immediately gives you that kind of business because they're also shopping around and they're entrepreneurs and they're very resourceful and they're big hustlers. And it's very easy for us to actually work across the value chain in terms of the collection and aggregation pieces and collect almost uh, uh, the first one year we averaged about three tons of plastic a single day. 
um, before we started pivoting our business model and becoming more polymer engineering and plastic engineering focused company. So um, uh, integrating with the informal sector has been has yielded us great results in terms of the scale. Uh, the one thing that uh, was a challenge for us is pricing, and I will come to the topic of pricing when we uh, discuss the topic. Right. Thanks, Mani. Um, uh, friends, so l let me uh, remind you, um, this is the last day of uh, the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, and we're talking to uh, Mani Vajpayee from Banyan Nation. Um, and um, if you have any questions or comments for Mani, please um, use the Q&A box below the um, below the screen and you can submit the questions and comments uh, your questions and comments and uh, we also have a viewing session from orissa bhubaneshwar and they'll be able to um, comment uh, they'll be able to submit their questions and comments through our chat here so um if you if uh, you're interested in organizing viewing sessions in the future let us know and then um, let's do something together and um also one more um, update uh, we will be beginning a, a weekly interview series soon, and um, the announcement for that will, will also be coming soon. So please um, follow us and uh, subscribe to us uh, so that you're, uh, you're updated, you, you keep updated. And um, with that, uh, and with that, let, let's go back to money, and then you know, let, let's understand, you know, what kind of um, what's the most important thing when you you know putting together a business. I mean, um, you know, both of us took the Steve Blank um, uh, class together and uh, he says, you know, finding a client or market is the most important. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, I mean, Osterwalder's business model canvas uh, where you're part of the Banyan uh, business team then was, I mean, the, the fundamental idea with Steve uh, Blank when he talks about business, whether it is movie making or a restaurant business or um, a recycling business, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, one thing needs to happen, which is the purpose of the business is to generate value. And value is just not economic value. There's, there's a perceived value. You, you, the, your, your core uh, purpose of existence is creating value. And specifically, when you talk about economic value, there must be a customer that is actually dying to uh, pay you the right value. And I think this is the key. When I talk about right value, uh, I, I, uh, let me apply that in the context of the recycling because I, I think it looks like you want me to talk about the numbers. The reason why I took my time in the initial five minutes to explain and establish that the entire value chain is informal in nature is, let us say young entrepreneurs, and I've seen a lot of startups spawn up in the last three, four years in the waste management space, particularly in the last mile collection and the informal sector integration models using technology. I think technology is one enabler. What happens is, it is really easy to integrate the informal sector. As I was explaining, they're more than happy to work with you if you give them business and you give them the right money. Now, for you to sustain that business, you need to create value in the back end and you need to have customers who purchase the materials for you that make unit economic sense. If you do not create business models that generate value across the value chain, you will not be able to sustain your business. And as a result, you won't be able to pass the value down to the informal sector. And then immediately the informal sector guys cut you out and uh, they uh, can find out another supplier. And uh, I, I guess uh, that's probably why you've uh, picked up Steve's um, uh, uh, case here. And uh, uh, the, the, the key thing that we learned um, in, in the lean business is there's the entire partnership and stakeholders and the supply chain, right? And uh, uh, the customers, you need to focus on each piece of the business model but every single piece of the uh, business model canvas is very critical to the company's success and uh, in Banyan's case we are not afraid to fail fast and fail quickly for us every interaction is a learning step and we take the takeaways and pivot our business model and that's been our core strength really um, after 2013 2014 where we were able to supply secure supplies from the informal sector we realized that the buyers of materials from Banyan Nation uh, weren't paying us the true economic value because the buyers were themselves also small SMEs 
who are extremely price sensitive and for them compliance or ethical business practices or taxes weren't really uh, the, the key pillars of their business. And as a result, Banyan was bleeding cash on every single transaction we were doing. And we could not sustain the whole relationship. And Banyan then started partnering with uh, large companies in the US. For example, we initially started working with DuPont to improve the quality of uh, the material that we were recycling and fetch a higher price in the market. By the end of 2014 uh, or over the end of 2015, as you probably know, we brought in uh, world-class plastic technique uh, plus testing techniques like spectral fingerprinting and uh, also uh, adding uh, chemicals to the recycling process to improve the quality of plastic materials and thereby started increasing the economic value. And thus we became sustainable and were also able to value the uh, sustain our uh, partnerships with the informal sector. And um, is there something specific you want me to talk about? But I, this is the general story. No, great. Uh, thanks, Mani, for sharing that. That's um, really interesting and innovative, um, uh, you know, way of uh, dealing with this uh, really large issue and also, you know, providing good livelihoods. Um, so um, we have a policy question um, your way. Uh, uh, Kaushik Chandrasekhar um, asks this question. Uh, he's asking, does the solid waste management rules 2016 and the plastic waste management rules or the e-waste ma management rules do these rules um, do enough for the integration of informal sector? Uh, what could be possible additions that could help integrate these workers better? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Hey, Kaushika, thanks for the question. Uh, no, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. The, the 26, one, what we must uh, like really recognize here, this is my take again, um, uh, is the policy and the government macroeconomic uh, and system, they are all enablers, really. And uh, the specific question of whether the 2016 plastic rules and the waste management rules have any provision for the informal sector integration, there are statements or there are uh, uh, concepts that these uh, uh, documents talk about where they say cities and, uh, and, and urban local bodies and municipalities must work towards the integration of the informal sector. But at the end of the day, when specifically talking about informal sector integration, entrepreneurs must always recognize that unit economics and steady business is what the informal sector integrators look for and integrating them is actually to your own benefit because think about it, just like the Dabbawalas of Mumbai, this is perhaps the most intricate last mile collection system that exists in a country like India and leveraging them is to our benefit, right? So, uh, so that is my take. Now, there are a few other comments uh, I have, right? Once the uh, uh, plastic waste management rules came about and there was this issue of informal sector integration, there are certain models that municipalities have been experimenting with. Um, and, 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 and I'd like to take the example of even Warangal and even Pune and Bangalore and a lot of these places. Informal sector integration doesn't mean only direct interaction with them. I think uh, this probably helps expand the scope of informal sector integration. If you look at a Kabadiwala, he's really a dry resource collection center. For example, he's, he's an unauthorized dry resource collection center nonetheless is a dry resource collection center so anybody can drop off their recyclable materials and get a price uh, or get some monies for their waste right now municipalities in collaboration with other corporates have established authorized dry resource collection centers where you have taken uh, 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 self-help groups or women entrepreneurs who were previously recyclers to get into the formal umbrella of uh, uh, government dry resource recovery systems and that is another beautiful way in which the government and corporates are engaging so to give to set a context for the dry resource collection center take a city like Warangal uh, you can take Pune you can take uh, Bangalore it doesn't matter now what typically happens in dry resource collection centers is just like the Kabadiwalas at a small at a much larger scale, you give them a thousand square feet to two thousand square feet a space, you give them access to technology, you give them access to partners like Banyan Nation and or ITC and groups like that, where they can sell the material. Banyan is a great customer for 
the dry resource collection centers and self help group basically establish a recycling center the waste collectors drop off the materials and get money for their materials so that is another way in which we can formalize dry uh, uh, recovery materials recovery and integrate the informal sector so there is a lot of models happening and the provisions for both the plastic and the solid waste management talk about the informal sector integration but my uh, takeaway is access to markets and unit economics and paying the fair price to them is only what's going to sustain them because at the end of the day like you put it initially they are entrepreneurs at the end of the day um and you cannot take a patronizing or a non profit tone to them but a market approach uh, to inform sector integration right and um well non profits have their role to play but um absolutely of course right yeah they they have a big role to play and um all of us know so much about the informal recycling thanks to you know lots of non profit work um but um let's uh, but again uh, when coming to the the policy um i know that all of these policies mentioned they have a statement like you mentioned about the informal recycling sector but again more than policy i think it takes political will um or will from the municipal uh, municipalities themselves to be able to you know work with them you know have some patience and time to work with these guys so um uh, we have another question um it's uh, from uh, let me let me add a couple of things i think that's a very good uh, question i think we should go a little bit uh, uh, um we should explore that the topic a little bit um so obviously uh, groups like chintan swachh uh, kkpkp i mean these guys have brought the cooperative informal sector cooperatives to the fore and in fact we've built upon those systems um the point about the government uh, policy there there's a couple of things right when pl- the, the plastic waste management rules actually makes it really interesting what the plastic waste management rules calls for is the formalization of the value chain it's it's very important to uh, understand uh, so the plastic waste management rule it says that uh, the there there must be a produ- responsibility uh for the producers to partner with certified recyclers in the back end uh, uh and and we have to tread these waters carefully that is why when i said recycler the informal recyclers it's an entire gamut that we are talking about right so there is a role for the government to play in the formalization there are a few things that can be done for example um not treating the informal sector as either the rag pickers or the kabadi walas or the aggregators or the recyclers you see what i'm saying right a you have to identify the piece of the puzzle and b uh, yeah. government is not the only uh, enabler there is a, a a startup corporate tie up with the informal sector b there is an economic value you have to drive there is an access to markets you have to provide and um, i think we are at the very initial stages of uh, all the systems being put in place and I, i and i believe that in the next like 5 to 10 years all the stakeholders will come together i think it's an idea whose time has come it's a tipping point that is happening we are at that tipping point phase wonderful to hear that money and uh... and um we have um, so let me um remind everyone that um you can send your questions and comments using the Q&A box below and you can also uh tweet to them uh using the hashtag waste dialog which is w a s t e d i a l o g um you can tweet to us uh, at, uh, with the hashtag waste dialog or at b waste wise now we have a question uh from nursing panigrahi um he is again uh, organizing a viewing session for us in orissa and he asks uh what kind of investments would we require to start up a plastic recycling unit in a city without any formal recycling and uh and what kind of materials should we target uh it's it's an extremely broad question um again plastic recycling uh, uh are you define how are you defining plastic i i, I think i'll try and quickly summarize in five six bullet items are you setting up a last mile collection business what is the value addition that you're going to be doing are you going to be just segregating plastic and then bailing it who is your customer right is your end customer a manufacturer who requires the plastic granules uh, and as a result are you going to follow through across the entire value chain 
is your end customer another recycler who's actually going to recycle the materials and your value is in segregating and bailing the materials so these are all the factors you need to understand before actually setting up a plastic recycling unit supply is actually the easiest thing today in india because as as i said informal sector is, is very vibrant and integrating uh, the informal sector has many models and the many people can give you plastic if you're talking about plastic but what exactly are you going to do with the plastic and who is your end customer what is your compliance cost what is your labor cost what is your unit economics and how much are you getting for it and how much are you passing down the value chain these are all the factors for to for, for you to consider before me passing a comment on what's the uh, 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 capex on this one and to banians in banians context we started off as a very simple plastic recycling unit where the first one year uh, we had become extremely good at segregation in fact our segregation accuracy in terms of the plastic resin and ranjit uh, can probably work with you offline is extremely high we had an understanding at a resin level now where we were spectrally uh, uh, fingerprinting all the plastic that had come to us as early as in 2014 to segregate plastic that was our usp then but then we realized that our customer was not paying us enough money to sustain the business so we had to go into plastic recycling where you had grinding washing extrusion and things like that then we realized that the buyers of the granules also weren't uh, paying us uh, the real value because they wanted us to sell it sell the material without bill they wanted to be in, uh, us also to be in the informal economy now with the introduction of gst now that is the other thing that uh, ranjit you were asking right there are many enablers in the system that formalize these value chain plastic waste management rules calls for working with responsible recyclers similarly the introduction of gst also uh, did its bit in formalizing the back end value chain demonetization also help the uh, this is something that i keep talking about because i think again i'll come back uh, even for entrepreneurs the cost of plastic recycling or the rather the cost of formal ethical and compliant plastic recycling um uh, is today not valued as much in india as it should be it's changing it's better now but 4 years ago it was horrible because for you to treat your water that you use to wash the plastic for you to be in compliance with pollution control board for you to pay minimum wages for you to pay taxes both on the purchase on um, uh, on the sale and i'll explain why you will be responsible for both the ends uh, in fact there is a gst provision by the way ranjit which says you can purchase material from non gst registered uh, recyclers as, as as well and there is a way in which you can legitimize the purchases there and remember in my early days i used to tell you that i used to purchase the material pay vat on it on my end sell the material pay vat on it on my end again to legitimize the entire transaction so when startups basically uh, think about uh, starting a business in the um, in, in plastic recycling i think the first thing is you really really want to understand the nitty gritties of the unit economics and the entire value chain dynamics and your customer is always comparing you to the uh, your competitor and if you are setting up a plastic recycling business your competitor is going to be an another informal guy who might cut corners and thereby make you unviable and uncompetitive so you have to pay attention to all these minutia uh, to be able to create a repeatable scalable and a profitable business i think that's the key right um and um you talking about gst this reminds me of a bunch of articles i i read recently i mean um all of them i think uh, said gst had a negative impact on the informal recycling sector um do you think you can comment on this or you know tell us what your experience has been um sure Let's see i mean uh, uh i don't want to take uh, uh, spend a lot of time on the gst aspect but um, the transactions in plastic recycling in india historically have happened as an informal economy where there was no paper trace trail there was no data around the amounts or volumes or prices and things like that now you suddenly introduce uh, a thing like gst in the plastic recycling business now that is why i said you have to look at the entire value chain not just at the front end or back end think about a plastic recycler that runs an extruder line right 
uh, and, which is about the in, in a fag end of the value chain, right? I mean, you have the uh, uh, rag pickers, you have the kabadi wallers, you have the aggregators, you have the recyclers, right? Now, the recyclers who are making pellets in some cases are selling to former formal businesses. So, if you are a plastic manufacturer and you're buying granules for me, the plastic manufacturer will actually sell articles in the market, right? Now, at the retail level, GST has been implemented very well. And as a result, the plastic manufacturer of market buckets, mugs, chairs, or whatever now pushes the recycler to be GST compliant. And as a result, this guy is now purchasing from the Kabadiwalas who are non GST compliant and uh, things like that, right? Now, there is a working capital issue that develops because of deferred uh, GST. Uh, 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 calculations. You see what I'm saying? It's not such a big deal. In fact, if you have an ethical or, or a GST compliant purchaser at the other end, there are provisions in the GST book which allow you to actually purchase material from non GST registered people. The only thing that happens is you don't get your GST refund immediately. You get it one month later when you work with non gst uh, compliant people so so there will be working capital issues but it's okay i mean it's not it's not been such a big hit for us because historically we've been uh, 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 calculating the vat and cst for our uh, buyers and uh, our uh, sellers so uh, we've always been doing this so it was not a big hit for us uh, uh, for us but i hear what you're saying i i can see some people getting into trouble Right. And um, we have um, another question for you, Mani. Uh, this is more about, I think, your business model, but you could also yeah. talk uh, about it in a much more general sense. You know, you don't have to talk about your business model. Uh, this is a question from uh, Rohit Nagar Goj, and he's asking, are you currently planning to work with ULBs? Um, and if yes, will your business model try to capitalize on any subsidies? Um, uh, so that's a great question. Um, uh, we don't directly work with the uh, ULBs in plastic recycling. I just want to be very clear. Basically, I don't know if you know, but Banyan Nation um, also has an entirely different business vertical. Uh, Banyan um, recently won the uh, Intel Department of Science and Technology Innovate for Digital India Award uh, for building a waste management IoT platform. Uh, one of the things that we do is we help cities manage their waste more effectively through technology solutions, which is software solutions. So that is how we interact with the uh, urban local bodies. But now coming to plastic waste, once again, it's important for us to stress that urban local bodies today don't collect any plastic. Uh, the, it is the informal sector. It is the dry resource collection centers, or it is the it is primarily the informal sector that collects plastic when it comes to post consumer. We have to make a difference between post industrial and post consumer. So uh, Banyan today does not work with urban local bodies directly for sourcing plastic waste. However, we work with urban local bodies on a bunch of other engagements that we have. All right, great. Um, I was doing some um, back-end organizing money. So, um, all right, so uh, we, we have um, only four more minutes, uh, uh, well, six more minutes. So um, are there any um, final thoughts that you have, you know, that, uh, you know, there are lots of entrepreneurs, like you said, um, uh, in developing countries, when it comes to informal recycling, there has been a, uh, you know, there has been a new um, energy when it comes to entrepreneurs. Uh, so do you have any final thoughts for them? You know, how, how should they, think about not just the informal recycling part of it or the plastics uh, or the waste management part of it, but um, uh, how should they also think about an entrepreneurial life? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I can only share what the way we uh, generally think about uh, entrepreneurship and I, and I believe in value generation and value creation. There must be a customer uh, that is dying for your existence somebody must be able to see value because of you setting up a company. So in the case of Banyan in the last, uh, uh, right from 2016, right? What Banyan has done is we've realized that unless the buyers of recycled materials 
are really passionate about using more and more recycled content in their packaging. For example, uh, mainstream fast moving consumer goods companies, automotive companies, um, uh, furniture makers uh, today in India and all these are multinational companies. So what Banyan Nation has done in the past 18 months or so is run engineering trials with multinationals across the world uh, to mainstream the use of uh, recycled content for product uh, manufacturing. And uh, uh, if you look at our journey, we started off as an informal sector integrate a technology platform to integrate the informal sector. Then we evolved by partnering with some of the best uh, plastic companies in the world to improve the quality of recycling. Then we started working with brands in the back end to find buyers for our recycled plastic who are willing to pay the real price and who value our existence. So it has been a constant journey of improving and iterating so that we become valuable as a company, not only in terms of uh, uh, our uh, 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 improving the livelihoods of our suppliers, but also in creating a very strong commodity play for ourselves. Uh, in fact, we are now a commodity in, in, in about six months. We're going to be a commodity company because we are uh, building a second unit in Hyderabad um, whereby we're bringing in uh, some really world-class uh, plastic processing technologies uh, to increase uh, the quality of the plastic. Basically, to give you a short summary, I mean, we are, we are bringing in cleaning technologies uh, to India such that the input into our recycler, into our extruders today is, is of an extremely high quality. So um, I think the entire value chain is important. The unit economics are important. Um, uh, leveraging the enablers, the policy. I mean, uh, 2016 plastic waste management rules have been a big boon for us. Um, uh, I, I, maybe I can actually share one example because it's already um, uh, uh, open and we have already uh, demonstrated it in uh, the Green Co conference uh, organized by CII. Banyan Nation became one of the first companies in India to do a bumper to bumper recycling with uh, uh, Tata Motors. Uh, we've demonstrated how bumpers uh, from automotive companies, used bumpers or broken bumpers from accident uh, bumpers from cars can be taken, recycled and given back to automotive companies to make new bumpers again. And uh, it's in a classic example of uh, uh, closed loop circular economy model, first of a kind in India. And there is a certain technology that was lacking in India to recycle the bumpers. And Banyan Nation was able to develop that over a space of last two years. So I think um, uh, companies have to create that value. Yeah, no, that, that's wonderful, and congratulations on being able to do that. And uh, now um, we have uh, a question from uh, Nigeria. Uh, Emeka um, is asking, I'll, I'll respond to this. Uh, uh, he or she is asking what GST is, um, and G, uh, he or she is from Nigeria. So um, GST is a government tax that was introduced in India, so um, uh, I don't think it would be applicable to Nigeria. So that, that's a um, response to that question. And uh, we have another question uh, from Vivek Patil. Um, he's asking you, Mani, uh, this is a ice cream for you. It's like a nice rasgulla for you. Um, so he's asking, I'm excited to see the informal recycling getting into the mainstream. Congratulations. What's your uh, future vision with uh, Banyan Nation? Uh, that's a great question, Vivek. Ban we really want to mainstream the use of recycled plastic, uh, Vivek. I think uh, my passion today is recycled plastic is seen today not as a uh, equal alternative to virgin plastic, but it is seen as a secondary alternative or a low-grade alternative to virgin plastic. Banyan is working to eliminate that. Banyan is working to mainstream the use. Our quality, the plastic quality is so good that we make. Actually, we've trademarked better plastic, by the way. Banyan's plastic today is called better plastic in India. And that's really our burning passion in the next two to three years. We want to put more and more mainstream, clean plastic today. Uh, uh, last comment and I'll... Uh, plastic... Recycled plastic in India today is seen as bad because of the potential mercury contamination, lead contamination, value chain untraceability. Brands are today scared. Uh, they were they, they're concerned if there's a child rag picker picking up the material. How is the recycling happening in the back end? Is water being uh, recycled? And that's what Banyan Nation wants to change. We want to clean the value chain completely. 
produce the best quality recycled plastic and ensure that mainstream brands use more and more recycled plastic. If you take it, put it in one sentence, we want to make recycled plastic, the use of recycled plastic cool and, and sexy and mainstream. And that's really what we are going to do in the next two to three years. Great. Thank you very much, Mani. That, that was a great session. And um, I hope uh, you know other entrepreneurs learned a lot from your experience. Um, so with that, I think uh, let's uh, end this session. Uh, you can stay on the stream, but I'll hide you from the broadcast. Um, but of course, um, yeah. So yeah, see you again. And uh, thanks, Mani. Thanks for joining hey, us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate talking to you. Yeah, great. Wonderful.